folks. Welcome back for another Feature Friday. I'm your host, Ryan Glover, and this week we're going to take a little bit of a break from code. So uh, the past few months, goodness, it's been a long time. The past few months, I've been kind of showing you bits and pieces of building the, the initial beta release of Command, the SaaS app that I'm working on. And during that time, it hasn't maybe been immediately clear of what I was trying to do. And the reason why is I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I wasn't 100% certain. I had some ideas, but I, I didn't really have the, the full idea formed in my head. Uh, but over the past month or so, or past two months, uh, I've started to get an idea of what that is long term. So I started to figure out what do I want command to be, what sort of features is it going to include, uh, and more importantly, how am I going to market and sell it so people actually want to use it. Um, and so now that the, the beta is in production, and again, I've got a few people using it, uh, and if you haven't already, make sure to head over to uh, oncommand.io, pop in your email address, and I can send you an invite if you'd like to play with it as well. Uh, but now that I've got a few people on there and they're starting to use it and giving me feedback uh, and the obvious bugs and stuff are getting fixed, now I'm starting to move on to other features. So these are features that I've, I've had in mind that I've wanted to build, uh, but I'm just now getting to the point where I'm ready to build them. And something that's come up really recently on the, the mentorship side of my business uh, is the, the question, how do you build a feature? And so that, that one kind of surprised me because there's a lot of content out here where I, I kind of step through building a feature, but I've never really done it or I've never really explained it at a meta level. So I've never actually walked through like, well, what do I actually do? Meaning in my own projects, how do I go from a concept all the way to a finished product? So what I wanted to do in this video, I'm thinking we're going to start now because I, I haven't finished this feature yet, but I want to show you the first part of it today and then maybe next week we'll go ahead and wrap up with... Uh, how I do the, the code implementation of it. Uh, but what I want to do is just walk you through my general process for figuring out how to build a feature, or what to do, and, and going from that, that concept or that idea all the way to a finished product. So the very first thing that I do is I'm, I'm always thinking from the position of, well, how is what I'm building going to deliver value back to a customer? And there's a great talk on this that I'll, I'll link below. It's not, it's not really a talk. It's, a, it's, it's a Steve Jobs responding to a heckler at, I want to say it's one of the WWDC conferences. Um, but in his response, he, he makes an excellent point um, about working backwards from the customer experience. And what he means by that is you don't want to think about building a feature from the technology side. Like, oh, I can use React for this, or I can use you know, all these new ES2015 features or ES6 features. Now I just dated myself. Um, I don't know, we're on like ES11 now. Uh, but the point being, you don't want to think from that perspective. You want to think from the perspective of a customer. So how is somebody going to actually use this and extract value from it? Uh, and so the way that I start, I would say 99% of features, unless I have a really clear vision in my head, is I'll do this. So what's in front of me here, I'm using a piece of software I really like called Sketch. And Sketch is just a design mock-up tool. So it lets you do UI design, little bits of illustration, but uh, it's, it's primarily used for doing UI design. So whenever I have an idea for a feature, or a better way to say it is how I want to approach a feature, what I'll do is I'll just spend a few hours inside a Sketch. So this I worked on yesterday. Um, I, I want to say I spent probably two hours, just kind of noodling with different layouts and different organizations until I got to a point where I could say like, okay, this is a rough idea of what I want. And when I say rough, I really mean rough. So this doesn't look bad, but you'll notice like there's little details, like I didn't finish the numbers on the side and there's actually a duplicate right there. And you know, like I've added some effects to the, to the line, just like rough little details that I may or may not incorporate into the final thing. The point being that what I've done here is I've spent some time thinking about like, okay, what's the, what's the ideal or what am I going after? It doesn't have to be 100%. Now, the reason I choose this versus a wireframe is that wireframes leave too much detail out. So wireframes are really great for figuring out the layout of a page, but when it comes to a feature that a customer is going to interact with, a wireframe leaves out 
enough detail where it's it's kind of difficult to think as uh, a customer like, well, how do I use this? Like if I put a little box over here that said date picker, that's not going to really mean anything to me as a user. But if I start to say like, oh, there's there's a, a date range and you can start to, and that's actually backward. Oh, wait, no, that's not backwards. June of 18 to May 19. Okay, we're good. Um, but if, if I can start to see these things, I can, as the developer, start to think a little bit more about like, well, how would I, how would I actually implement that? And how is this going to work from a customer's perspective? So that's number one. So the very first thing is figure out a design. And I know a lot of developers will bitch and moan about this. They'll say, well, I'm not a designer. I'm not anything. At the end of the day, like there's nothing really special going on here. I've, I've drawn some boxes and I've played with some, some colors and light, but it's like I haven't done a lot of work. And so the point is not to have an expectation that you're going to be this phenomenal designer, but to spend some time just trying it and doing it. Um, so I know that especially if you're, you're used to uh, working as part of a company or if you're a contractor and you work as, with, a, with a broader team, it's really easy to silo yourself into a very narrow specialty. And from that perspective of things, there's nothing wrong with siloing yourself. Like you, it's, if you're in a position where you can leverage a team to help you build something, great. But if you're, you're trying to build something on your own, you have to accept that you're not gonna have those resources or you most likely won't have those resources. Maybe you will. Uh, but the idea is that you gotta, push yourself and you got to do the work, especially if you're building one of these by yourself or it's just you and one other person. And if that other person doesn't do design work, well, guess what? You're going to have to put in the effort to try and figure out what it is. Now, that may seem like a complete waste of time, but the reality is, is that the more that you do that, the better you're going to get and the faster you're going to be able to ship a feature that looks really polished and really nice. It just takes time. That's about it. Uh, so try it. Try and, and start at this point, like give yourself, and it could be, it doesn't have to be in a piece of software that you don't understand. Like if you don't understand Sketch, uh, use something else. Or if it's not a software thing, just sit down with a pen and paper. Uh, but go beyond the, the fidelity of just gray boxes on a page. And really, like if you're going to do it with pencil and pen, like sketch out like the, the date picker over here and maybe like draw a nice curve so you kind of understand like, ah, I want the chart to look like this. But start with that. So that's one. Now, the second thing that I do is I do implement stuff. So I kind of lied earlier. I was saying we're not going to really do any code. Uh, and we're not going to do a walkthrough of code, but I do want to show you some code. So what we're going to do is look at what I did or how I started to implement this. So this feature isn't fully wired up yet. This is just me going through the process of getting it on the screen. And that's the way I like to think about it. So uh, I start with my mock-up. And then the next step is, okay, let's get that mock-up in some form onto screen. And this is usually where I see people start to get muddied a bit. And the reason why is that technology thing. So technology versus uh, the customer experience. And so, again, you, you, it's, it takes a second. You got you to gotta be like the, the nun slapping your, your hand with the, the ruler like, stop that. Don't do that. Um, and so the way around it is you just got to force yourself. You got to say, okay, while I'm building this, I'm only going to use what I know or I'm aware of or think that I can learn very quickly and not introduce some new thing that will impress technology people but have no actual return on value for a customer. And again, if you're building a product, you got to keep in mind you're not building it for other nerds. You're building it for people who are tr going to pay you money, hopefully. And so you have to think from the perspective of, okay, if this person's going to give me money for this, what kind of experience can or do I want to deliver back to that, to that customer? So always keep that in mind. Uh, so when it comes to the code, what I'll do is I'll just use my existing tool bag. So a good example of this, and, and this comes up quite a bit, um, not this specific one, but stuff like this. So uh, TypeScript is all the rage and I know that a lot of people are interested in learning it. So a big mistake that I usually see is, well, I'm going to, I'm going to start work on this feature, but I'm going to build it with TypeScript. And then usually if like, if I'm in a conversation with a mentee or something like that, and I ask like, well, do you have any experience with TypeScript? If the answer is no, then the reality is that yes, you can learn how to use a technology by building something, 
that's actually the best way to do it. But if your goal is to build something that's uh, really polished and really ready for a customer, you want to avoid using technology you don't have experience with and techniques. So not just the technology itself, but the techniques that you're using. So keep that in mind as you're developing. Like don't just introduce a bunch of stuff just because. Like you're, you're kind of piling onto your brain. So it's already hard enough to figure out how to build a feature, let alone learn a new technology, then build the feature. And ultimately the, the reason why is it's not just about the customer experience, it's also about you. So the reality, unfortunately, with a lot of these products is people start them, but they don't finish them. And the reason why is because of stuff like that, because it's inevitable that, so we take that example, it's inevitable that Okay, if you, if you don't understand TypeScript and you're going to try and use it to build some new feature, you're going to hit a wall. And that wall may be, I, I don't know much about TypeScript, but you might hit a wall with your type system or some compiler doesn't work or so, something that's going to uh, kind of discourage you a little bit. And what you want to do is eliminate as many of those points of discouragement as possible. And so by using the tools that you already understand, it makes it a hell of a lot easier to just say, well, I'm just going to focus on being discouraged by the feature itself, meaning uh, does a date picker work for this type of input that I'm trying to get, or uh, how am I going to handle filtering of the data, things like that. You're more focused on the actual feature that you're building and not the code, not the technology. So something to keep in mind. So following that, that rule for myself, what I've done here is I've already built out um, a lot of my UI components in this, this uh, UI library that I'm working on called Fur. So if you haven't checked this out, go over to cleverbeagle.com slash fur. Uh, it's not live yet, but you can sign up for the mailing list. Don't ask me for a ship date. It's one of those things that I'm kind of working on in the background, but eventually this will be available to the public. Uh, so I'm using stuff that I've already built. I'm not trying to reinvent UI components from scratch. I'm just trying to reuse that. And then the next thing in here that I've used is ReCharts. So ReCharts is a library that I came across somewhere in the like one to two year range. And it is absolutely wonderful for doing uh, charts inside of React. So uh, and not only is it, is it a good library for building charts, it's, it's really slick. Like the way it, it works and the stuff that's already built for you is really nice. Uh, so I kind of made the decision like, okay, this is something I'm familiar with. And, and I stopped myself. So the first thought I had when I started to build this feature was, oh, well, I don't need to use a charting library. I can just use D3. And I actually did. Like, so yesterday I, I did this mock-up and then I started to go through the process of building this mock-up. And the very first thing that I did was I started to go read about D3. And I was like, well, maybe I can just build this myself. And I went down this rabbit hole for about 30 to 45 minutes. And then I realized, like, you're wasting time. And the reason I was wasting time is I don't really have immediate, any immediate need to learn D3. And it's just a distraction from the task at hand, which is building the feature. And so even me having said this a hundred times and knowing this in my mind, you constantly have to watch yourself. You constantly have to say, stop it. Just go build the damn feature. And, and you'll hear me say this in videos or if you ever work with me one-on-one, -on -one, I'll just say, just build the damn thing. And I get a little fussy. So you got to just focus on building the damn thing. Because once you do that, then you can always go back and improve. And that's the beauty of code, is we can always go back and change stuff. You don't have to stay married to whatever the first version is, which is great. Uh, so uh, yeah, recharts. So we, we're working with this. And again, the reason is I'm familiar with it. I know how it works. I don't have it completely memorized, but I knew it enough where I, I said, well, instead of fiddling with D3, I can work with this and I know that I can get a result a lot quicker than I could if I went down the route of trying to wire up my own custom charting solution. So again, you're looking for things that are going to save you time without compromising on quality. And so again, this is one of those things where the quality of it, so the visual appearance and the quality of the documentation, those sorts of things all have an impact on how fast you can ship a feature. So if, it's, if you're in a situation where you don't have things like this, so maybe you'd never picked out a charting library before, the second best thing that I can recommend is looking around a little bit. 
and being aware of picking the most difficult solution. So again, instead of writing your own charting library using something like D3, consider the, the stuff that's out there and really do your homework. Don't just spend 10 minutes and you know only clicking the links on the first Google page. Like really dig around uh, for different parts. And even take the, take the slight setback to instead of inside of the product you're building, maybe in like a scratch project, taking those different components and trying them out and seeing like which one of these feels like it's going to align with my own thinking the best. So maybe you have a mental model of how to, to use a chart and you want it to work a certain way. Or which one do I just, I install it and it just works exactly how it says in the documentation. Um, and I say that because a lot of libraries don't necessarily work the way that they're described in the docs. Uh, so something to keep in mind is that when it comes to picking out your parts, like make sure that you're using stuff that you're either familiar with or you completely understand and that's going to help you speed up this process and avoid getting discouraged. So the next part of this is not nearly as entertaining as the other stuff. So and again this is another one of those hurdles that you have to jump over and that is building the thing. And so this mostly comes from experience. So, and what I mean by that isn't, again, it's not about the technology. So you'll notice here, I've got revenue chart, chart header, chart switcher. What I'm doing here is these are all styled components that I've written. So again, I'm not telling you to use style components. I, it doesn't really matter what you use as long as you can style whatever you're doing. Um, but the point I'm getting at here is that the way that I've done it, so the way that I've organized this stuff and the way that I've structured it, that comes from experience. So knowing that if we look a little close, let's see if I can get these side by side. Uh, so if we look back at our mock-up, so this header bar up here, so the monthly recurring revenue, the date switcher, all that stuff, and then this line, so that's the header in my head. So I knew that, oh, well, there's an HTML header element, and somewhere in here, there it is. So chart header, I knew to make that a header element. So that sort of stuff only comes from experience. Like there's nothing that uh, you can really do aside from practice to memorize that sort of stuff and the way that you think about structuring your markup. So the actual code, that again, it's just practice. So if you're just starting out and you're like, well, I don't have that experience. I don't know how to do this stuff. The best thing I could tell you is practice with one ca caveat, which is, get really, really, really comfortable with throwing stuff away. Meaning, and that could mean you spend an entire day on something purely for the sake of learning. So one of the ways that I've really improved my skill set is doing exactly that. There is, and, and actually we can look at it. Let's see if we can find it. So is this my projects folder? Yeah, this is my projects folder. And then let's go into Clever Beagle. So there's all kinds of stuff in here that is just me playing. So I, I, I couldn't even tell, like uh, this. I think this was me trying to learn how to do um, Lambda functions, not in use. Never used it past like two days after I wrote it. Uh, let's see. Uh, Pupgrade CLI. I spent months building a command line interface. Only used it for about half a year and then decided to scrap it. The point being that that CLI, for example, I didn't know how to build a command line interface before I built that. Going through the steps of doing that, I learned how to do it. So a lot of people are surprised at the stuff that I know. The only reason I know it, the only reason is because I said, like, ah, I don't want to do this, but screw it. I'm going to try and teach myself how to do it. And that process is exactly what you'd expect. So it's, it's struggling with the code. It's reading a bunch of documentation, reading Stack Overflow posts, it's, it's doing the work. Like there's no way around that. But the benefit is now, if someone comes to me and says, uh, can you help me build a command line interface? I can say, yeah, I know exactly how to do that. I, I have the steps in my head. And more importantly, and this is the key part, I have the code. So I don't just have the idea and the patterns in my head. I also have a reference that I can go back to. So when you're building your own stuff, always keep that in mind. It's, it's not necessarily about the current end result, but maybe you can get some value out of just building something, putting it in a scraps folder, and then coming back to it later. So don't basically what I'm getting at is don't get discouraged if the way that you build it isn't the best in your eyes. That's great, because if you, if you have that attitude of, okay, this isn't the best I can do, 
that means there is a best that you can move towards. And so you just got to practice until you get there. And it may take time. It may take a few days. It may take a few months. It could take a few years. Again, I've been doing this for damn near a decade at this point. So it's not something that you're just going to snap your fingers and get it. Like you have to do the work. So keep that in mind. Uh, but getting back to our current conversation, uh, what I did here, so all I did was I took this mock-up and I started to think about what is the HTML and the CSS for this. That's it. So no functionality, nothing like that. Literally just what is the HTML and the CSS. That was part one. And what I mean by that specifically is, so we see the chart here and we see all this stuff. I ignored the chart. So I literally just said, let me get the frame or the box for this feature. So the header, I didn't wire up the drop down. I just, I just mocked out like, okay, I know it's going to have a label and an arrow next to it. Uh, this isn't even on the page yet. Um, and then I mocked out how this is going to look. And then I mocked out the container, but there was no chart whatsoever. Um, and so what that helps you to do is to see how does this fit into my existing application? How is this actually going to play on screen? And if you think about uh, mobile versions, responsive versions, how, if I start resizing the browser and playing with this, does it adapt in the way that I think? So the, the point here is that I'm not committing 100% to my design yet. Again, I treat every design almost like a, like a scientific hypothesis. So it's like, I think this is going to work, but I'm not sure. And again, I don't get married to it. So I avoid uh, really getting my expectations up about the end result. So I say like, okay, what I've designed here, this is the ideal. This is what I hope to get to. Uh, but I don't get it in my head that like, if it doesn't look exactly like that, I'm a complete failure. It's, I say like, well, I'm willing to compromise up to a certain point. And so that's another thing to keep in mind. Like don't, don't worry about it being pixel perfect. Worry about it being pixel close and functional. That's a, that's a million dollar idea right there. So uh, back in the code, what I did, I just mocked that stuff out. So I got my wrapper around everything. And like even this stuff I didn't do. So I've got this chart switcher, which is this drop down right here. I didn't have that implemented at all. I literally just started with that frame. And so once I had that frame, I got it on the screen and I was able to kind of make some decisions about like, well, uh, this, is, this is how this thing's gonna play out and make a decision of, oh, okay, I want to keep pushing this forward. This looks good. So that's when I started to play with the chart. And so now this, this part existed. So chart highlight is this little box up here in the top left corner. Um, and then the actual chart itself starts here. So it's all of this stuff. So the next thing I did, and you'll notice, I still haven't wired this up to live data. So this is kind of the, we're starting to teeter into the next part of what I do, which is, I fake the data. So I don't try and force myself to pull live data from a server yet. All I'm concerned about is getting something on screen. And so the best and easiest way to do that is just to fake your data. So I went into the docs for this recharts library and I said like, well, what, how does the data work? Like, what do you have to pass? How does it, what's the structure of it? And then I just faked it. So I just sat here for five minutes and did this. I just copied a bunch of lines and then I renamed some stuff so I knew it would look right. And then that was it. And I stopped myself. And the reason why is it's really, it's another one of those things where you can get caught up is you start worrying about the data model and like, oh, well, I got to do this. I got to do that. Blah, blah, blah. And it, again, another point of discouragement. And we're trying to eliminate those in this process. So the reason this works, and it took me a while to, to really wrap my head around this and learn it. Again, coming from the developer perspective, you're kind of thinking like, well, I got to do my data model first. I got to do all this. But if you think backwards from the customer experience, so that, that idea we talked about from Steve Jobs earlier, if we think backwards from that customer experience, what happens is we're designing it not just for the user, but we're also kind of giving ourselves instructions as to how our data model is going to work and how the actual logic is going to work. Because if I look at this, right now I'm saying like, well, what, what is the chart that I'm working on? So the default one that I picked, I think, is the uh, monthly recurring revenue. Pretty sure that's the, yeah, that's the default chart that I set on the state. And so what I did was I just faked that data, but in the process of doing that, I gave myself the data model that I'm gonna need to return from the server. So keep in mind, this is technically knocking out two birds with one stone. So not only am I getting it on screen, I'm also communicating to myself, hey, you're gonna need an amount and you're gonna need the month that that amount corresponds to. Pretty cool. 
So not only am I drawing something on screen and kind of getting myself excited about the feature, I'm also kind of telegraphing back to myself later like, hey, you're going to need to make the data look like this if you want it to look like it does on screen right now. Pretty cool. Uh, so that's what I did. I sat here and I tried to figure out like, okay, what's the, the basic structure for the data? And then I spent, honestly, probably two, three hours just noodling with the documentation, familiarizing myself with the code again, because again, I've, I've worked with this library before, but it wasn't recent. And so I just had to sit and play and I was just going through the docs like, oh man, can I, can I add some padding to this? Can I get the margins right? How do I do the colors? Uh, like this one, this is how I tell the line that it needs to draw itself based on the amount field in all of my data records and stuff like that. But again, I gave it ample time. And this is another big one, which is when it comes to setting expectations, don't expect to just blow through everything. You can, but again, that's going to be detrimental to the quality of the product and it's going to affect, have a negative effect on the, the end customer experience. So you got to keep that in mind. You can't just blow through everything. You got to, if you, well, I should say, if you want to build something of a high quality, you have to take time with it. So like I just said, this was, I think it was two or three hours. I did it last night and I want to say I started about seven o'clock and I, I got tired around 10 o'clock. And then that's when I put it down. So it was easily two and a half, three hours at least. Uh, just noodling with this and getting it right. And that's fine. That's the thing. You know, there's this notion that speed has to be the primary concern. Like there's like you're going to win a trophy for doing it at lightning speed. It's like nobody cares. Nobody's even going to see it. That's the thing. It's like the end result is always going to be the thing that you get judged by no matter what. Unless you, for whatever reason, you have some other developer sitting with you and they're a dick and they're just like, well, that took you too long, you idiot. It's like. And generally speaking, it's easy to handle those people. You tell them, like, go fuck yourself. You know, like, don't, don't worry about that. So when it comes to your own stuff, take your time. Be patient. Expect there to be hurdles. Expect it to take some effort. Because building things of a certain quality takes effort. And if you're committed to that quality, then there's no problem. Um, and there's, a, there's a, a side note to this. And this came up recently um, on the podcast that I do with my buddy Alex. Um, and if you haven't checked this out, go to cleverbeagle.com slash podcast. Um, and it's the episode on, I think, process, actually. It's, uh, there were two episodes. There's process one and two. Uh, so check those out. But <clears throat> in it, he talks about, or he hinted at the idea of um, people building products because they need the money that that product is going to generate. And I've seen this again and again, and I've done it myself, which is you get into a situation where you're, you're putting too high of an expectation on the money that your product can generate. And so you instinctually just kind of rush yourself to the point of finishing the product with the expectation like, oh, okay, if I get this done and then I get it out, then I'm going to start making some money and then it's going to work out. And even when you build a good product, that's usually not the case. There's just a long timeline from start to actually making money and to actually making real money with these things to where you can live on it. And so keeping that in mind is probably an, another one of those like top five tips that I can give you for building these things is don't expect it to generate anything for you. Like go in with the expectation that you're going to invest all this time and you're not going to get anything out of it. That's not necessarily true, but the point is that with that expectation, you're not going to unnecessarily rush yourself. So you're going to be able to give two or three hours to something because those two or three hours are going to improve the product. You're not, and you're not worried about the, the, the short term result of it. You're not going to care if you screw something up and you got to go back and fix it, or you're okay kind of implementing something and then waiting a day or two and then coming back to it and tweaking it. Um, and so the, you may ask like, well, but, but what do I do for money? Like, how do I do this? The, the reality, and this is, you may be thinking like, we're talking about this in a process video. It's like, yes, because this is part of the process, which is you have to struggle. Like there's no way around it. It's like going to the gym. The first few months are horrible. You hurt, you're pissed off, you don't like it, but slowly but surely you start to see a result. Exact same thing with this. You have to put in the time up front if you expect a large result later. 
as simple as that. So what, what do I mean by that specifically is, well, okay, if, if you want to build a product and you want that product to take over as your, your, your main income, main source of income, you have to get comfortable with doing shit you don't like in the short term. So there's plenty of things that I've had to do and am doing and, and that means, you know, like, so I do like my mentorship business. I like doing that a lot. Um, and I do some contracting too. So I'm doing a lot of stuff. Some because I have to, some because I don't. So technically speaking, I don't have to build command. Um, I could completely live off of the, the mentorship business that I run as is and not do anything. But what I've learned over time is that you want to constantly be pushing yourself and challenging yourself to the point where not only this work gets easier, but you get more and more comfortable with the long term and not having these crazy expectations. So a lot of stuff like right now, I've taken on a, a contracting project over the past few months, <clears throat> not because I needed to, but because I knew that, well, yeah, it's going to make me some extra money, which is awesome, but it's also going to give me a challenge to build my skill set a little bit more. And every time you do that, you're just going to get better. That's it. But if you don't have your expectations in order, you're going to rush through everything and then when all is said and done, yeah, you're going to have completed some work, but the quality of it is going to suck and it's not going to resonate with people in the way that you want or need it to. Uh, and so it's less likely that you're going to find the success that you're after. You know, contrast that with taking your time and being a little more deliberate about things. You're going to end up getting what you want. But the reality is that it, it's either going to take you time or it's going to take you money or a combination of both to get what you want. There's no, no shortcut around that. Now people will sell you shortcuts, but <laughs> there, there are no shortcuts. It just takes time. That's about it. So rant over or rant aside, um, now that I've got this on screen with some test data here, the next thing I want to do is start to think about the interaction. And so let's jump over to the browser. So in command, I've got this wired up. So I've got a little drop down here and I can switch stuff. So you'll notice that my numbers are changing a little bit. And if we refresh the page, did it refresh? It didn't refresh. There we go. So we can see when I hit the page, my default values load up and I've got my, my chart data kind of drawing on screen. Super exciting. So keep in mind, I haven't touched a database. I haven't done anything, but it looks like I have. So kind of in the, the subconscious, I'm like, yeah, this is fun. This looks awesome. And I did. I sat here like a nerd for like a good 30 minutes after I stopped working last night, just kind of staring at it and clicking stuff and playing. And it's like, that's, that's good stuff. That means that you're excited about what you're doing and you're going to keep going with it. So you want to create as many opportunities for that to happen as possible. So that was the next part is once I've got my chart wired up, so the chart data was part one, but then all this other stuff, what I did was I started to fill in the blanks. So when I first built it, I just hard coded. So like right here, I've got uh, this React expression saying, oh, tell me the chart name that I've selected. But when I first started, I literally just had uh, monthly recurring revenue MR, just hard coded. And that's the point here is don't, don't start with the dynamic stuff. Just get it on screen, get the bits on screen, and then go back and add that dynamism. I guess that's the word for it. Or add the dynamic capability or features. So what I did to do the dynamic stuff, again, I'm just using static data. So I, I wrote some objects so like chart name here is me mapping from the uh, select values here. So I've got this navigation item popover and let's reorganize my screens here. So I've got this navigation popover. So I've got monthly recurring revenue. So if I click this one, it switches to that one. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm trying to say, okay, in that drop down, this is active if the current value of this state chart is MRR. Um, and then I have this function here, handle change chart, which goes in and changes the chart name. But then in terms of actually rendering this stuff to screen, the very first thing I do is I just say, okay, match the chart name based on uh, whatever this.state.chart is. So here chart name is mapping to this object. And then I'm just passing this.state.chart to say, give me that name. So that's actually how that's going to perform in real life. I might tweak it a little bit, but that's, that's close to what it'll be. Uh, but then when it comes to the chart data, so here I've got chart data and that's kind of a crappy name. Uh, and the reason why is that that's not actually the chart data that we saw. That chart data is down here with this hard-coded array. This chart data is referring to everything else around the chart. So uh, this number over here, this percentage, um, 
I want to say, no, not the current value. So it's just this data right here right now. So I haven't, I haven't gone beyond that. So again, I'm still in the process of building this. Uh, so what I did is I knew that based on my mock-up, I had, okay, well, when I'm looking at this, I have a number. If that number is positive where it's gone up, so I'm making the anticipation that, well, this is going to work from, from or between two ranges. So I'm trying to say, um, over here, based on the date that you select, there's going to be a difference between the date A and date B in terms of the, the value of the numbers that have changed. So in this case, I'm saying, oh, it's up 23% this month. Um, and so what I have to do is fulfill that. And so the way that I thought through it, I was like, well, how do you simulate that? Or how do you, how do you figure that out? So what I did is up here on state, I just hard coded some nonsense values. So these don't actually exist. Uh, and so what I'm saying is, all right, so I know that I'm going to have MRR, AR, ARPU, and active customers. Those are the, the four, <laughs> four test values that I had. Uh, and then I knew that, well, each one, in order for this to be dynamic without a bunch of headaches, each one has to have the same exact data labeling. So I kind of placeholded those. And then I just filled in some junk data with one specific detail, which is, again, in order to know whether it's gone up or down, well, if it's going down, I need to know it's a negative number. And if it's going up, I need to know it's a positive number. Uh, and so that's what I did. I just hard coded those percentages in. And then to simulate it and get it on screen, what I did was I said, well, right here, get back the chart data for the current chart. So if it's MRR, we're going to get this dot state dot MRR back. And then my first question is, is it going up or is it going down? So if it's up, that means that chart data dot percent change month does not include a negative percentage. So again, right here, you'll, you'll see I'm doing change month and change year. I'm anticipating where I'm going to go with this. So uh, eventually I'm going to make it so you can flip between filter by month, filter by year. So the only one I'm doing right now is change month, but that's why change year is here because eventually I'm going to make it so that's dynamic as well. So once I have change month figured out, okay, is it up? If it is up, I just want to return that value, whatever it is. If it not, I want to return that value replacing the negative sign. So I want to get rid of the negative. You may ask, like, well, why would you do that? So the next part, so I've got is up here. And what I've done is I've passed that around. So the, the most important one is right here. So I say, if it's is up is true, I want to return the word up inside of this box. So I'm saying up, and then I know that I have a percentage. So it might be up, it might be down, I don't care. I just need to know if it's up, tell me it's up. So we're gonna say the word up, and then we're saying, well, what's the percentage change? And percentage change is what I've grabbed right here. So I'm saying, if it's up, it's going to be the change, whatever it was, so the positive number. And if it was a negative number, I'm just getting rid of, rid of the, the minus sign or the negative sign, because down here again, I'm saying, where'd it go? There it is. I'm saying, okay, if it's not up, it's down. So I'm communicating to you. I don't have to say down negative 25%. I'm just going to say down 25% this month. So the idea here is that I'm not worried about, again, the database. I'm worried about just getting something on screen and starting to play with this from the perspective of the user. Uh, and so realistically, this code is going to go away. I might adapt it somewhere else, but the point being that I'm going to scrap a lot of this. But the positivity and the positive outcome here is that I'm able to see what a user is going to see right now. So before I've done any server side work or database work, I know exactly how this is going to behave. I know what to expect on the database side. So I know that, well, I have to return a total. I have to return a percentage. I have to say whether it's up or down. This view details I added last night, this is kind of giving me a hint like, oh, there's going to be some extra data there. And it's just kind of communicating to you what you're going to need to do. But most importantly, and this is my favorite part, I think this is where we're going to end for this one, is it lets you play. So one of the things that is severely underestimated is that, uh, and I, I say this for myself, as computer geeks and nerds, like we like to play with stuff. It's fun. And so you want to keep that in mind as you're building things. Like it should be fun. Like right now, I'm just clicking on this and I'm enjoying seeing it. Like the numbers are changing. Oh, cool. And I get, I bet you're, you're probably think like at least one of you is like, oh man, he could get the chart data to start redrawing when he does that. It's like, yes, I could. 
Um, and so that's the idea is you're, you're trying to give yourself not only a, a view from the customer's perspective, but you're also giving yourself something to do because ultimately this stuff is boring and it's hard and it's laborious and it's just, it's a pain in the ass. Um, and so wherever you can find those little bits of joy to kind of motivate you and keep you going, do it uh, because that'll help you immensely. So I think we are, we're going to wrap up here, especially because I got I to gotta go teach somebody. Uh, so that's going to do it for this week, folks. Um, hopefully you enjoyed that. Again, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up next week. So I should have this finished or at least push forward. So we'll kind of push forward in my process with wherever I'm at. Uh, but hopefully this was helpful. Um, I know it's a little bit different than what we're, you're probably used to, but um, I hope it's, it's giving you some insight into how I do it and showing you that it's not magic. It really is just hard work and spending the time and putting in the effort to get it done. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to head out. Uh, as always, make sure if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button down below and then hit the bell right next to it if you want to get notifications uh, as soon as these are released. Uh, and if you haven't already, follow on Twitter. I really appreciate it. So it's twitter.com slash clvrbgl. I have to remember that one because somebody took Clever Beagle and I'm going to get it one day. Uh, I can't believe somebody took it, but I'm going to get it. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's it. I'm going to quit rambling. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, signing off for the HMS Beagle. I'll see you next week, folks.